It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. It's been too Every year we gather together here in Rockefeller Chapel, the site of Dr. King's first major speech in Chicago, to remember him, his work, what he stood for, and, importantly, his continued relevance today. The theme of tonight's event asks, why must we continue to sing this song? It is a song that preaches the myth of disposability, that there are certain classes of people who are just not worthy of justice or second chances. We shall overcome. Hey, we shall, oh, we just overcome. And I believe there are four things that if we take to heart, we can truly honor the life of Dr. King. First thing I am persuaded we must do is that we've got to get proximate to the people in our nation who are living in the margins of society, who are poor and neglected and abused. We've got to get proximate. The second thing I am persuaded we have to do if we're going to honor Dr. King is that we've got to change the narratives that create the problems that we fight. Right now, there are 10,000 children, 17, 16, 15, 14-year-old children being housed in adult jails or prisons. I worked on a case some years ago involving a 14-year-old boy, and I went to the jail to see this little boy, and I was astonished to see this terrified child walk into the visitation room. The little boy sat down, and I sat down, and I started asking him questions. But no matter what I asked him, he wouldn't say a word. He just sat there. I was sitting there trying to figure out what to do, and at some point, I just leaned on him. And when I leaned on him, he leaned back. And when he leaned back, I put my arm around him and I said, come on, you got to talk to me. I can't help you if you don't talk to me. And that's when this little boy started to cry. And through his tears, he began talking to me about what had happened at the jail. He told me on the night before I'd gotten there, so many people had hurt him. He couldn't remember how many there had been. And I held this little boy while he cried hysterically. And the question I had when I left that jail is, who is responsible for this? And the answer is, we are. We are. I'm worried about the weather, I'm worried about the environment, but I'm also worried about this epidemic of trauma that we have in our cities and our communities. And I want us to declare a health crisis and begin to reach these children. We can't do it until we get proximate and change the narrative. The third thing we've got to do is that we've got to stay hopeful. Your hopefulness is key. Hopelessness is the enemy of justice. The fourth and final thing, that we've got to be willing to do uncomfortable things. My clients have been broken by poverty, broken by disability, broken by racism. I work in a broken system. And in the midst of this agony, I realized is that I do what I do because I'm broken too. But I also realized that night that there's power in this community of brokenness. You see, it's the broken that understand why and how mercy works. It's the broken that understand the way justice is supposed to redeem and restore. It's in brokenness that we can actually change the world. But I believe we will fight not by ourselves, but with this larger community of people who understand the challenge of our day, which is that we stay closer to the poor and neglected, that we stay hopeful, that we change these narratives, and that we do the uncomfortable things that justice requires. I want to wish all of you the best and God's blessings on each and every one of you. Thank you. Come on, clap your hands if you want to make the change.